Hey guys, welcome back to the Hack It Out podcast. This is episode 26. Been a little while since we've had one, but today we have our guest, Tynan. How's it going, Tynan? Doing pretty good. How you doing, Patrick? Doing good. Glad to have you back on here. Uh, today's topic is definitely one that I know you're really going to enjoy and probably have a lot to talk about. Yeah. Uh, book to movie adaptations. This is my favorite topic ever. <laughs> I'm honestly surprised that I haven't really touched this specific topic uh, yet because uh, you and I, I know, see a lot of movies. Uh, you're a much more moviegoer, much more of a book reader than I am, but uh, a lot of movies I like to see are adaptations of books or comic books or whatever, so uh, this really is a perfect topic for us to discuss. Yeah, books and, and movies are my main uh, source of entertainment. <laughs> that's uh, that's what I do all the time. Like I'm, I'm a extremely heavy reader yeah and i go see a completely outrageous number of movies <laughs> every year and watch even more at home like it's it's a it's a sickness but i'm i'm ready to go for this one okay so basically what we're gonna do with this episode we're gonna discuss our three best uh book to movie adaptations and then discuss our three worst and then we're just gonna have some uh thoughts kind of related to the whole genre of book movie adaptations that we'll kind of discuss uh and then we'll have a a special treat at the very end which i know you already know of but our uh listeners will get to be in anticipation of that oh, yeah. <laughs> uh so we'll let it's, you kind of it's worth hanging out for so <laughs> yeah. it's it's gonna be good yeah uh we'll let you uh start it off we're just gonna take turns so you'll talk about your uh first one and then me and then we'll kind of just bounce off each other like that and I don't know how yours are ordered, but my three aren't in any particular order. Like, Yeah, mine aren't really either. Okay, so uh, we'll jump right into our three best book-to-movie adaptations. Uh, Tynan, you're up for your first one. So, yeah, okay. So I didn't want to go necessarily, like, straight three best. Mm -hmm. uh, I went with more of, like, the three that I'm the most passionate about and the, most, the ones that I love the most. Okay. Uh, so maybe not the ones that I think are, like the most technically sound or anything like that. Right. You know, it's just, it's the ones that I just am really passionate about. And that's actually what I was, I was actually going to say, um, was how, how we are categorizing these as best. Like, uh, mine personally aren't necessarily, yeah, like you said, they're not necessarily like what I think are the best, um, like adaptations or the best, like just movie in general. Yeah. It's more like the ones that I enjoyed, the most yeah and one of mine uh i love the book and the movie but like the reason that i had to include it on here mm -hmm. is because i've never read something that i thought was less adaptable to the screen before <laughs> and they turned it into one of my all-time favorite movies and i just like i'm staggered that somebody read this and thought yeah we should make a movie out of that <laughs> uh because it is it's baffling that anybody could have that thought after reading because it, it is so like you know you hear about books that are like oh this is unadaptable like this is unscreenable mm -hmm. that is the most unscreenable book i've ever read <laughs> in my life and it turned into a tremendous movie so you know we'll get to that one here in a minute but uh my first one is the princess bride okay I've never read that book but i do love that movie yeah the the book is a lot like the movie <laughs> it's uh you know not one of those that's like a shot for shot mm -hmm. uh depiction of it but it's not that far off either. It's it's so good. Uh, the book is a ton of fun. Um, it's written like it was written, I think, in the in the seventies or something like that. And it's written kind of like as a almost like satire of kind of the old like medieval melodramas that were written at the time. Like you mm -hmm. know, and uh, so it's written like sometimes in like kind of overly gaudy language and stuff like that. But <laughs> oh my gosh, it's a lot of fun. Uh, and if anybody that's listening to this has not seen the movie, yeah, it's amazing. You need it to watch it. It is a great movie. I love the movie. It is so funny. It's so uh, different. Yeah, it really um, is. It's really unique. The actors and, and actresses are, are all great. Mm -hmm. uh, you have Andre the Giant in there. Uh, <laughs> Carrie Ewells is in there. Uh, and that was, I think, one of his first uh, uh, big, gotta be. big roles, yeah. I think. 
I don't know that it was necessarily his first. Definitely but a breakout role. Yeah, though. it was early, and uh, so if you like him, mm-hmm. he's amazing. Um, I don't know who the guy that plays Bazzini is. I don't remember his name. Who? Uh, Vicini. I I can't remember the characters' names. I, I'm not the that little the with short it. guy. Uh, like you never mess with a Sicilian, or you never match wits with a Sicilian when death is on the line. Yeah, you know, I, the, I'm not sure. Uh, and then it's got. Uh, um, Robin Wright, of course. Yeah, Robin Wright, uh, who you might know from House of Cards. House of Cards or Wonder was, Woman. I think that no. was... Oh, was she in Wonder Woman? I never she saw was. Wonder Woman. You didn't? Uh, no, okay. I didn't. Uh, yeah, she was in there. I'm down on comic book movies, man. Like I'm I know just, you've kind I'm, of been a little... I'm really... I've taken a pretty hard pass this year. I went to go see <laughs> Guardians, and I think that's the only comic book movie in the past like 18 months or more that I've seen. Like I'm just done. Yeah, uh, I know it's just you, too much. It's kind of overstated. It's welcome for you, I know. <laughs> but yeah, I think that was one of Robin Wright's first roles too. I don't know. Yeah, Again, I don't think it was a, her first, but it was a early. breakout. Yeah, um, Billy Crystal. Yeah, Billy Crystal's in there. And uh, then I just blanked on the guy who you know the inconceivable. Yeah, I know. That's who I was trying to think of. Oh, a minute ago was that? Too. Was yeah, that his that's name? Bazzini. I, okay, I couldn't remember the character. Yeah, name. I can't remember that's the what I actor's name. About. Yeah, uh, it's completely. I, yeah, I'm having a hard time with him. Wow. Normally, I can. I'm pretty good with actors' names and. Yeah. Yeah. But anyway, yeah, I, I know who you're talking about. Uh, I mean, just a, it's an amazing cast. The book mm-hmm. is great. Like, if you like the movie and haven't read the book, you should go read the book because you'll like the book a lot. Um, there's a sequel also to the book called Buttercup's Baby, hmm. which it's okay. It's not as good as The Princess Bride. Uh. But yeah, that's that's gonna be definitely high on my list of any like crossover, and it's one that a lot of people I don't think realize is a is a book. There's so many out there. Like I have a whole list of ones that are like as I was looking it up, they were books that I didn't, or they were movies that I didn't realize were books mm-hmm. until I started looking it up for this podcast because I would <laughs> I was trying to like refresh my memory, and make sure I wasn't gonna miss something critical, right? Uh, as I came up with my top and bottom three. And as I was looking through these lists, I was like, really? That was a book? Like, I need to look this up. Like, uh, like The Birds. I had no idea The Birds was based on a book. Yeah. It I never mean, crossed my mind. There's a lot. I mean, like I said, I'm not a huge book reader. Um, and so there's a lot of movies I've seen that I know are based off of books. I've never read the books. And uh, I, I don't include those on my list because I'm only including stuff on my list where I have read the book and right. The yeah, book, I did so. too, but I just made a, yeah. I made a second list of ones <laughs> that I was like, that was a book. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, I guess to jump into mine, I'm kind of biting off a pretty big one here. Uh, I'm just kind of generalizing it and just going to say the Harry Potter series. I'm putting that as, as one of my best adaptations. And now again, like I said, I'm not necessarily going off of just how well, it was actually adapted from, you know, book to movie, but, uh, how much I enjoyed it. I mean, considering you took a seven book series and pumped out eight movies, I mean, for the most part, I thought that, um, you know, they did a a really good job as far as the adapting goes, but, you know, I really enjoyed the movies. There, there are a couple of them that are obviously at the bottom of my list of favorites of the movies. Uh, but, I've enjoyed seeing every one. I've got really fond memories of going to see each one in the theaters and just the, I mean, the joy and excitement of, you know, waiting for the next one to come out and, yeah. uh, you know, yeah. the same joy and excitement of the books and stuff like that. And while they you know, obviously that you can nitpick those movies to death of little things that they didn't include or things they oh, put yeah. in or things they changed. Yeah. Um, I, I still just love the, the overall look and feel and just a book series especially a big series like this that you have immersed yourself in so much to be able to see like these objects and these characters and these scenes, like actually see them portrayed uh, outside of your imagination was just, I mean, I mean to just to be using terminology, but it's magical, honestly. Yeah. They did such a good job and that's, that's definitely, uh, I think both of our, our lists, it's Mm -hmm. a real theme that the movies that we thought of as the best adaptations were the ones that did 
an amazing job of bringing of, of world building. Mm-hmm. You know, it wasn't necessarily yeah. just the characters. It was like we have to bring this whole thing to life, and yeah. we're going to build an environment around them that is so you know believable mm-hmm. and and rich, and you know just has all this depth. And that was what they did. That was the best thing they did with Harry Potter. Yeah, and was uh, that they didn't try and confine it to Hogwarts. They right. didn't you know limit the character list mm-hmm. too badly. Uh, you know they. They showed us, you know, the castle, and they showed us Hogsmeade, and they showed us Diagon Alley, and they yeah. took us to the Quidditch World Cup, and they did all these things, like, you know, everything they did, it was just, there was always, you always knew there was more going on outside of Hogwarts. Like, yeah. The world was always really rich and deep. And what I liked was, like the books, the movies, um, you can tell, kind of aged, like the books did, because, you know, the first one starts out, it's very much you're you're kind of growing up with yeah. Harry. You know, it's very much a young, you know, young child entering in this world of magic and awe and wonder. But then by the end of the series, it's gotten very kind of adult themed, really dark, uh, yeah, kind of somber it, in some ways. And uh, I really like that the movies kind of portrayed that yeah. transi- that growing up transition, just like the books did. Yeah, and it's kind of like those books, you know, just ended up themselves and the movies too, did a really good job of... Like, okay, we're going to make, you know, this this magical, you know, unrealistic and unbelievable world. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, these characters are going to go through the exact same transition that everybody in this world goes through, which is that, you know, when you're young, everything is uh, kind of awe-inspiring. You know, there's all this technology or, in that case, magic and all this stuff. But as you grow older, you see... Uh, more and more there's there's cracks you know there's there's problems there's people that are you know suffering there's right you know i mean there's things like that so i mean that's like a big theme you know of those books is that it's kind of like growing up and and like you're like oh the world is maybe not quite as (laughs) as blemish free as as it appeared when we were 11 definitely but yeah, so that was my first one. So on to your number two movie. All right. So this is the one I was talking about a minute ago where you're just like, how in the world did you think that this was a good idea to turn it into a movie? Uh, but it's Arrival, which uh, is based on a uh, short story or a novella, you know, whatever term you like, uh, called The Story of Your Life. And I had no idea that that was based off anything. I loved the movie. Yeah. I did not. I mean, I didn't realize it was based off something. So that's uh, cool. So it was written by a guy named Ted Chang. Oh, by the way, the Princess Bride is uh, William Golding. So if anybody wanted to look it up, that's who wrote it. And I guess if we need to say Harry Potter is J.K. <laughs> right. Rowling, if you didn't already know. If you know. didn't know that, I don't know what we can do to help you. Uh, but yeah, Ted Chang wrote The uh, Story of Your Life. And it's uh, actually it's in a collection of short stories that's also called The Story of Your Life. Hmm. Um, but you read this book. Uh, I didn't know it was based on anything when I went to go see the movie either. I didn't realize that. And then as I was watching the credits at the end, it, you know, I noticed, uh, you know, based on the oh, okay. work story of your life by te- or written by Ted Chang or whatever. And I thought, Oh, like I really need to check that out because I got to the <laughs> end of arrival the first time. Uh, okay. So for context too, uh, I was really looking forward to the movie passengers when it came out. Uh huh. And uh, these came out at basically the same time. Yeah, there's like, what, a month in between I the think two it was or, even less. I think maybe. it was like a week. Yeah. Um, they were pretty close. I don't remember, but anyway, and I might be remembering this backwards. Like, maybe I was so high on arrival, but uh, <laughs> I think I went to go see Passengers first. I don't... Maybe I'm getting that backwards. But uh, I remember, I just expected Passengers to be, like, the next great sci-fi movie. Mm-hmm. And I was so disappointed by it. Like, it's just, it's not a good movie. Like, I was really, really bummed out by Passengers. And then Arrival comes along, and it's like, holy crap, this is the next great sci-fi movie. (laughs) Like, I didn't even know going in. I had no idea. Uh, Like, I wanted to see it, but I didn't really have a whole lot of expectation going into it. Yeah. I didn't really know what. Because I didn't really know what it was. Mm -hmm. I didn't, you know, I basically went because it was Amy Adams and Jeremy Ritter. Right. And, I, you know, I was all in on that duo because I like both of those actors. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I went to go... Oh, and Forrest, Forrest Whitaker was in there, too. Oh, yeah, that's right. He was in that one. Uh, but, yeah, I went and go, went to go see it, and I just got to the end of it, and I was just in awe. Like, mm-hmm. I love a ride. Like, that is... Great movie. If you haven't seen it, yeah. I mean, we're not going to necessarily spoil anything for it, but if you haven't seen it, go see it. Yeah, go see it. I'll, 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 I'll keep my, my notes on it non-spoilery. 
uh because it, it is worth not being spoiled on it definitely but, uh, is yeah it's i like i got out of that and i just was i it was like one of those movies you get to the end and you just like can't even speak for like 10 minutes because you're just like oh my god that, that was, was so good. good like i just have to sit here and bask in the afterglow of arrival yeah uh i mean it's one of my favorite movies of the past 10 years or so like like it was awesome it, it's a it's a top 10 all-timer for me i love that movie now there's probably people that are listening they're like were we watching the same movie like <laughs> what is this guy talking about uh surely not but i loved it yeah uh and anybody that didn't well i'm sorry <laughs> uh but no you read the book though and the book like they kind of uh they kind of manufactured some uh like <sighs> situations of conflict for mm. the movie of course um I mean, they got to embellish some things yeah for the screen but in the book there's just there's literally there's no conflict whatsoever like you read the book and it's like this weird uh like kind of esoteric like thought exercise almost like as you mm. read through it like it it's it's a really weirdly structured um it's I, and when I say weird, that's not a bad thing. Like I yeah. want to clarify that. Like it's a really, <laughs> really, really well written story. I need to check that out. Yeah, uh, like I said, I didn't even know it was. Yeah, it's based it's. Off. Uh, I didn't realize it. Yeah, anybody that saw Arrival, you should go and read. It's only like thirty or forty pages. So even if you're kind wow. of a little bit reading averse, they took thirty um, or forty pages and turned it into. Yeah, I might yeah. be underselling that by. It might be closer to sixty. I'm well, not either really sure, way, but like, it's it's short in short any of story, it. Because huh? it's part of like a. I don't know, roughly like 300 page collection of short stories. And there's okay. like five or six things in there. So it can't be more than maybe 75 pages at the and most. They just decided to yeah, take uh, that one and turn it into something. Oh my God. <laughs> and the, the short story is so good, but you get to the end of it. And like, again, I'm, I'm trying not to spoil anything, but like you get to the end of it and it is absolutely baffling to me that somebody mm-hmm. read that and they were like, yeah, we can turn this into a movie. Like I, it blows my mind that somebody thought that yeah, and that they turned it into such a good movie. It worked. It worked really oh well. Oh my God. It's so good. And it works. And it, I mean, just everything about it is great. Uh, you know, it's, it's shot gorgeously. Like all mm-hmm. the cinematography and everything is amazing. Um, which by the way, we're not going to talk too much about Blade Runner. I don't think, same, uh, same guy. but it's the same director and the same, uh, same guy doing the final pass on the screenplay and everything. Yeah. That's Dennis Villanueva, I think is how you pronounce his last name. Yeah. Um, but he is amazing. He also did two other movies that were based on books that were good uh, called Enemy and Prisoner. Hmm. Uh, and both of those are really good. He's a great director. But uh, yeah, I mean, it's just, it's a gorgeous movie. Like from start to finish, the whole thing is just amazing. Anybody that hasn't seen it needs to see it immediately desperately right now like right away go like let's just just stop listening to this podcast and no go. no no finish the podcast and then watch it but okay well um we'll jump into my number two and that is uh the hunger games catching fire which was the sequel it was the second hunger games book so it's the second movie uh me personally i enjoyed the second book the most out of the out of that trilogy and likewise i enjoyed the second movie the most out of the four movies that were made, um, pretty much everything that I really liked about the book, uh, they captured on screen really well. And now I, I really enjoyed the first movie. Obviously, there's a lot of things that are are different. A lot of I, did you ever read those? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I did read them. I read them after. Uh, yeah. Same here. I read them. I think. I read I them I read, after the first movie. Yeah, I think I read the, all three of them after the first. That's movie exactly came out. what I did. Um, so by the time Catching Fire came out, I'd already read them. So I knew I knew what. You know, I knew what differences were they were going to be, but um, yeah, obviously with book movies there there's differences, and you know this isn't without those same flaws. But like I said, everything that I really enjoyed about the book, the movie captured now as well. Remind me, uh, the second one is the one with the like the clock yes. arena, right? And that's why I, that is I the coolest. That. that is the coolest set piece yes. of all three. Mm-hmm. books or movies that clock arena yes. is the coolest mm-hmm. idea ever whenever i was reading that in the book i was sitting there thinking man i cannot wait to see this yeah on screen and see yeah. how they do it and they did it really well and um i thought philip seymour hoffman uh portraying that great. portraying Always that great. game maker 
uh, was really, he did a really great job. You know, it was sad that, you know, he passed away before the other movies ended, but they did a good job, you know, um, kind of still putting him in there and the way that they handled it was really well, but I'm not going to talk about the last two movies. We could do a whole podcast too on just adaptations that Philip Seymour Hoffman was amazing in because Philip Seymour Hoffman was pretty much always amazing. (laughs) Like he was one of our best. Uh, best actors. Yeah, but, but anyway. they they did a good job. Uh, Suzanne Collins, I believe, is the author's name. And um, yeah, yeah, I, I, think I, that's right. I mean, I don't really know what else I can really say about it. It's not obviously it's not as huge of a world as something like Harry Potter, um, but it's still the, it was big enough though. The look and feel of everything that I had read and imagined in my head from that book, I thought they did a great job with. And I mean, sure, there's things that I, I wish they would have kept in, or things that I wish they would have. Uh, done a little bit differently but i i mean personally i just think it was a lot i thought it was better done or more enjoyable than the first movie and certainly more so than the last yeah um i think i like the second book the best i think i like the first movie the best though uh i really like uh i like when when there's like an ambitious plan Mm -hmm. like that and it's got a relatively low budget and it kind of forces the the writing and the and the directing to be really inventive. Yeah. Well, I, yeah I and I think that. the hunger games is a really cool mm-hmm. example of that. Cause I mean, don't get me wrong. It wasn't a small budget movie, right? But it didn't have anywhere near the, like the staggering budgets that the second and third one. And well, I guess they split the third one. And right. so it was like four, but yeah. Uh, I think that's a problem that we're going to talk about later, right? Like, yeah, we'll, we'll, t- we'll like talk way too many times. Yeah. But yeah, so that's, I mean, that's my number two. I don't really have any, any more to say on the matter other than I thought they did a great job. Yeah, no, they did. They did good. I enjoyed those movies a lot too. I think I actually think, uh, I don't know about the third one, but like the first two, I think that's probably one of those examples where the movie kind of surpasses the book. I think, uh, cause I don't know that it's as rich, but I yeah. think, I think like I felt more, you know, like I, I a can, part of it. In I the, can see in the that first two. I, I would almost even <clears throat> say that a little bit about the third one, just because I didn't really care for the third book that much. Yeah, the third book kind of like it gets a little repetitive and kind of rambly. And if it, memory to serves, me it was kind of boring a little bit too. Yeah. Uh, so some of that I enjoyed seeing. I it was more entertaining to watch it on screen. Yeah, but. and I think like all these scenes, like uh, not that not that she's a bad writer or anything, but uh, these scenes like where you had all this like kind of emotional turmoil that Katniss is going through. Mm -hmm. Like she wasn't able to write it as well as Jennifer Lawrence was able to show it, you know, like, because Jennifer Lawrence is, is a great actress and, uh, you know, she's always had a lot of depth of, uh, emotion in her characters. And so she was really able to sell that really well, which is like having long periods in a book where you're trying to sell emotional turmoil Mm -hmm. is always difficult. You know, that's one of the probably most difficult things, to get right when you're reading like if you get it even a tiny bit wrong it just becomes tedious right and it's really hard to tell whether you're on that line or across it one way or the other yeah um so because like on one side it's tedious on the other side it's like oh this is really melodramatic and then there's that really really fine line right in the middle and it's the hardest thing to tell and it's in movies too but they just Mm -hmm. happen to have jennifer lawrence you know if they had you know somebody from a lesser uh, pedigree, mm-hmm. you know, of acting talent than Jennifer Lawrence that maybe wouldn't have gone over so well. Okay, well, we'll jump into your number three. Um, All right, I'm excited. <laughs> I know you are. <laughs> Try to contain it a little bit. All right, so my number three is It. Um, well, let's talk about It. Yeah, I'm really excited. <laughs> uh, it's also going to get really confusing uh, talking about It and then just saying the, the word, word It. it. <laughs> uh, always confusing when you talk about this book. Yeah. But this is uh, one of my all-time favorite books. Uh, it's one of my top three. I'm a big Stephen King fan to begin with. Yes, you um, are. You know, I know a lot. He gets a lot of kind of bad rap because uh, he's not exactly like uh, one of those writers that just like has this crazy command of the English language, like a Cormac McCarthy or somebody like that. But mm-hmm. uh, God, he's just good, man. Uh, and see, I've never read any of Stephen King's books. I've never never read any of them honestly um i don't think i've ever actually seen any of the movies oh all the God. way through at least but that are based off of any of his words not even like shawshank or anything like that 
Mm -mm. Uh, like I said, not oh all the way through. Gosh. I've seen bits and pieces. Uh, Shining and Carrie might be the only ones I've seen all the way through. Like the original or the newer one? Originals. Okay. Are, yeah, they're good. Um, <laughs> those are probably the only ones I've seen all the way through, but it's been so long, it they might as well be new movies to me. Yeah. Man, you're going to have to catch up. Uh, <laughs> so I'll say this to start with, too, since we're on that end of the subject. Uh, I don't know that there's anybody over the past... Uh, roughly 50 years that has had more of an impact on uh, entertainment in general, but specifically on movies than Stephen King. Hmm. So I actually, I did not know this, but I looked it up uh, last night. He's had 62 movie adaptations. Really? Uh, and he has two more coming out before the end of the year. And for anybody that's interested, uh, we are recording this on uh, Saturday September 9th. Uh, September 9th, so it's the day after its official release. Uh, the Thursday night release of it was the highest grossing for on a Thursday night for an R-rated movie, for a September release movie, for a horror movie, and for a Stephen King wow. adaptation. That's pretty good. And it's currently projected. Uh, it's Friday night was the biggest uh, Friday night for an R-rated movie ever. It, it blew out Deadpool by about $4 million, I think. Oh, yeah? Hmm. And it's projected to finish up the weekend as the second highest R-rated release ever. And it will go down uh, almost certainly at this point as, at worst, the second highest grossing Stephen King movie behind The Green Mile. Oh, okay. I forgot that was Stephen King. I have seen that one. Yeah, time. so I I'm going to I'm gonna talk about that in a minute, too, because okay. uh, it's worth noting how few of the great Stephen King movies get credited as being Stephen King movies. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> So, uh, there's two more Stephen King movies coming this year, and I would just about guarantee, because of how successful it is, mm -hmm. that we're going to see... First of all, there's going to be an It Part 2. Right. Uh, that was always the plan, so I know I've, I've heard people that are like, oh, does everything have to be a franchise? Like, it was always two parts. Um, because of the way the stories it kind of had to be, right? Yeah, so in the book, you have two stories that are happening simultaneously. You have the story of when they're kids, which in the book is 1958, and then the story when they're adults, which in the book is 1985. Um, and those stories in the book, you jump back and forth between them as they're right. kind of paralleling each other. Mm-hmm. Uh, in the movie, they decided to split uh, all the kids into the first movie and as adults into the second movie. I'm not sure exactly how that's going to work, but I'm interested to see how they do it because the first one is so good, and I'll tell you about that in a minute. But uh, they, uh, so it was always planned to be two movies. That's mm -hmm. always been the plan. So like, don't get too upset. Like, you know, we're not going to be dealing with. Uh, you know, five years from now, having like our twelfth it movie, right? Like it origins. The, it's a, a Stephen King cinematic universe. <laughs> yeah, but you know what? Like, I would not be surprised if we kind of launched a little bit of a Stephen King cinematic universe because his movies are so interconnected, or his books, I mean, are so interconnected. Right. Um, he is a writer that has always loved to reference himself mm -hmm. in, uh, you know, another book. So, uh, you know, it has ties to the Dark Tower, which we'll talk about later. Uh, <laughs> and uh, just a ton of other... I mean, the Dark Tower ties into everything that he ever wrote. And it ties into a lot of it. Uh, <clears throat> Derry is a recurring location in many of his books. I think probably 10 or 12 books take place in Derry. Mm -hmm. Just like, uh, you know, Castle Rock is probably a little bit better known because that's where I think Carrie was in Castle Rock and the Dead Zone was Castle Rock and Cujo was Castle Rock. Uh, but Derry is my favorite Stephen King location, just mostly because of it. But uh, so anyway. It's a great movie. Uh, the book is even better. It's one of my all-time favorite, favorite books. Like Some people will let the length of the book intimidate them a little bit. Mm -hmm. It's a really, really long book, which uh, Stephen King has never been known for his brevity. <laughs> you know, I mean, this is not a guy that counts pages as he's writing right. that way. Um, which no author should. No, no. He sometimes gets a little overboard with that. Uh a lot of times you'll read a Stephen King book and you'll think, man, that probably should have been about 300 pages shorter than it was. Because <laughs> uh, he's got, you know, more than a couple thousand plus page books to his resume. And it is one of them. It's, I think, depending on the edition and the and the type, 
and everything. You know, I think it's anywhere from like roughly 1200 to 1500 pages. That's um, not too bad. No, really. it's not. It's not like a, you know, yeah, it's not terrible, but you know, it definitely some people, is more than what the average. Yeah. The some, average some people are, are a little bit put off by the size of the book, but don't be worried. Uh, it is, it's a long book, mm-hmm. but it doesn't feel like a long book when you read it. And, uh, Gosh, we'll get into this more later, but if right. you've seen the new movie and you liked it, pick up a Stephen King book, because there's never been a Stephen King adapted movie that felt more like reading a Stephen King book than this new movie feels like, uh, and I'll talk more about that in a little bit, but uh, uh, it's it's so good. It tells, you know, for, for anybody that doesn't know, if you've only seen the TV miniseries from the 90s with Tim Curry and all uh, that. And I haven't even seen that. Yeah, uh, that's most people's experience with it and in right. that world. Uh, Usually, when you t- say it, that's people. Yeah, exactly. That's what. That. That's exactly what you think of. Tim Curry. Which uh, you know, I like that miniseries. It's not bad. But the problem with that miniseries is, uh, it's a miniseries about Tim Curry dressed as a clown scaring children. Mm-hmm. It's not a book. It's not about anything that the book was about. Uh, so if anybody out there doesn't know, it is not a book or a movie about a scary clown. It's, right. <laughs> it's not what it is. Um, you know, it has very little to do with that. The book is really about, uh, I mean, it's a coming of age story as much as anything else. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> so if you if you don't, if you're not familiar with Stephen King... He is never better than when he's writing about childhood in the 1950s. Uh, he is brilliant when he writes about just because that was when he grew up. And right, that's, that's what he's you know he has just he a deep, deep <laughs> love for that period of time, and he yeah. writes and just makes you fall in love with the 1950s. It's it's like I've never felt uh, like a lot of connection to the 1950s, but you read something of his and you're like, oh my gosh, like I need to live in the 1950s. <laughs> um. But, you know, it's a, it's a story about growing up. It's a story about uh, just really the nature of fear. Um, it's a story that's a lot about um, how adults and children, like the relationship between adults and children, mm-hmm. um, you know, basically that a lot of adults either will attempt to take advantage of children or will kind of ignore them and, and not really listen to something that they're saying because they're kids you know like you i could i could gather that just by the uh the couple of trailers i saw yeah, from it you could tell this kinda this is a much that. much much more true adaptation and now don't get me wrong for anybody that's thinking like you know oh it's like you know it's exactly what the book is it's really not like it's it's more almost of an interpretation than an adaptation but um it's not a shot for shot remake it's nothing like that but it feels like it you know it feels exactly like reading the book felt and it gets the right things right but i'll talk more about it later but we'll save the rest of that for a little special section at the end yeah um so for the sake of time we'll just go ahead and jump right in i'm not gonna have too much to say about my third uh my third one it i i kind of copped out just a little bit um while it's still an adaptation it's not a book to movie adaptation but more of a tv adaptation and that is uh, of course game of thrones but more specifically i'm going to be talking about uh you know the book series is called a song of ice and fire and the first book of that series is called a game of thrones right and i'm specifically talking about that first book a game of thrones in correlation to season one of the series because season one was solely based off of book one and uh in terms of and now this one i'm kind of judging on in terms of an adaptation itself and I thought that it is one of the best adaptations of just about anything because I thought that it adapted it so well. I mean, so much of it was. Have you ever have you read any of no? The books? I haven't. I uh, I like to read my books a lot, like I read my television, or like like a lot, like <laughs> I watch my television shows. Uh-huh. Uh, I'm a binger, like and he's not through and yet, through. So. and I am also. I'm afraid he's going to die before he finishes. I mean, he's yeah. old. He takes a really long time to write. Uh, I've heard, like they're saying, there's two more. I've heard there's there might two. be three. Yeah, um, there's six and seven. Yeah, I've heard that he might end up splitting it again because originally it was five, wasn't it? Originally it was three. Originally it was okay, and yeah. then to five. 
Yeah, I've seven. I've heard a couple of times, yeah. and uh, he didn't say this. Like I met him. I I, I went. Oh to, really? Yeah, yeah. I got George R. R. Uh, Martin. Yeah, I don't know if I mentioned that. But. Yeah, sorry. Um, so I went to a uh, book signing in Santa Fe a couple of years ago. It was a Joe Hill book signing, which. For anybody that isn't familiar with Joe Hill, he doesn't have any good adaptations yet, so I couldn't talk about him today too mm-hmm. much, but I'm going to weasel him in here anyway. <laughs> He's Stephen King's son. Okay. Uh, he is a... Okay, so Stephen King is our greatest storyteller. Like, you might not think he's the greatest writer. You might not think he's the best of this. You might not... But he's our generation's greatest storyteller. Uh, you know, there's nobody that had more stories and more rich stories to tell. And did a better job doing them. I mean, the man's written like 75 books. It's crazy. Yeah. Uh, But Joe Hill writes a more sound and complete story than Stephen King. Like, Stephen King has a tendency to kind of get lost in his own story a little bit. Mm -hmm. Joe Hill writes, you know, a little bit more succinctly. Uh, And some of Stephen King's best endings, actually, Joe Hill came up with. Oh, wow. Uh, So, anyway... (laughs) Uh, but anyway, I went to went to this place, and it was this theater um, that George R. R. Martin bought and renovated. It was from the 1920s, I believe. It was a like a really old theater, hmm. and it was going out of business. And so he bought it. He lives in Santa Fe, by the way. If anybody didn't know that, uh, and he's like, I think he's a lifetime. Uh, he's lived in Santa Fe his entire life. Oh, okay. But uh, so he bought this theater that he knew from like his childhood, I think. And renovated it and turned it into this amazing space. Like, it's really, really cool. Uh, but he hosted, uh, like, a Q&A with Joe Hill before the signing. Hmm. And then when we <clears throat> when we got to the part of the night where it was actually time for Joe Hill to sign everything, uh, they started to basically dismiss people to go out to the lobby to get their stuff signed. And they did it from the back to the front. And I was all the way at the front because, you know, that's my boy Joe Hill. Like, right. That's my guy. <laughs> Uh, so I was sitting close to the front and, uh, while the people in the front were waiting for this autograph line to kind of, you know, go through, there were several hundred people there. And, uh, so everybody just asked George R. R. Martin questions. And by the end of the time that we were there, there were only like 10 of us left in the theater. And, uh, so we got to just really have like a really just straight conversation with George R. R. Martin. It was really cool. That sounds um, pretty cool. And even he, like, somebody asked him, like, is it still only going to be six or uh, seven or seven books, you know, whatever. And, like, is it still the plan? And he's like, oh, I don't know. Like, the story keeps kind of growing in my head, and I'm not sure I'm going to be able to get it down in a reasonable number of pages and right. yada, yada, yada. Um, you know, so <clears throat> I, I, I'm a little concerned about that. So that's why yeah. I haven't read the books yet. Well, I will at some point, though. I, I know I will. I mean, there's... From what I've heard, he has uh, he's pretty much given everything to his. I guess he has a daughter that's yeah. an author that yeah, if he something has plans. To him, she, yeah, yeah, he has plans. So it's it. good to know that he's got a plan in place. But uh, no, I thought that season one did a really good job adapting from that first book, and then season two was you know loosely adapted from book two, and then you know it kind of goes down. Well, not down as as far as gets worse, but the adaptability kind of goes down from there. Uh, you know, they start playing a little bit more loose and um, with the way that they do certain storylines, things start getting kind of out of place. They do things in different orders. Um, they cut things, they add things. But season one and book one are, are very, 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 very close. And so that's why I'm including that on my list because I, I really enjoyed it. I, I love that first book. And seeing everything and a lot of the lines, I mean, a, a lot of the dialogue is, I mean, almost verbatim uh, in the show as it is in the book. And I, I, I thought that's great. Now, obviously, it had a little bit of an easier time because you're not adapting this giant book to like a two, two and a half hour movie. You're adapting it to a 10 yeah, hour season. I think this, season, is, this so, is something that we'll talk about later, too. But I got yeah. I got thoughts about yeah. about it as a TV series, too. But so, it, you know, it, it kind of had an easier time. Um but either way, I still felt like I wanted to include it on my list because I really enjoyed the adaptability yeah. of and it. And again, world building. Exactly, because it is a giant building. world. Um, now, we're going to jump into our three worst adaptations. We're going to need to be a little bit quicker in this section. Yeah. Um, we're we're kind of, time's not on our side right now. But that's all right, because we don't have a lot of nice things to say. So Right, so <laughs> it was good that we kind of embellished a little bit more of yeah. our 
best adaptations. So this it's more one, fun to talk about things you're passionate about than right than things. Of course, that you don't like. some of these we might be <clears throat> passionately. Oh yeah, against. there's there's one that I'm really <laughs> so, really passionate about. But. Um, but either way, uh, we'll try to be a little bit more brief on on these. But we'll go ahead and start with your. Number one, worst adaptation. Yeah, so I'm going to go straight back to the Kevin, <laughs> Stephen King. Well, actually, two of my worsts are Stephen King's. But uh, the first one is The Dark Tower. came out about a month ago, yeah. roughly. Uh, so you had two okay. Stephen King movies a month apart, pretty much. Yeah, and Gerald's <laughs> Game comes out next month. So, And that's, a, of course, it's on Netflix, but still, it's, a, still it's a coming out. movie, yeah. Uh, and there's also... Uh, for anybody that doesn't know this either, there's also two television shows that are Stephen King based that are running right now. Uh, the Mist is on. Don't watch it. It's horrible. Um, <laughs> and Mr. Mercedes is on. Do watch it. It's great. Um, <laughs> okay. Which so is funny time. because the books are like exactly the opposite. Like I didn't care for the Mr. Mercedes stuff at all. And the Mist is amazing. Anyway. Um, but the Mist is like 60 pages long. And we're turning it into like a multi-season show. Like anyway. Sorry. Dark Tower. Um, <laughs> yeah, Dark Tower. Uh, so anybody that goes to see the Dark Tower movie and you're like, man, that was a garbage movie. Why would I ever read these books? <laughs> the books had nothing to do with that movie whatsoever. <laughs> uh, that movie has been in production for almost 15 years now. Wow. And it was a case of having way too many people with veto power on everything. And they ended up with this bland nothing of a movie because there were five different studio heads or like this between the studio heads, the director, Stephen King, sorry, uh, and the producers, there were five different people that had override authority on everything. Wow. So like even down to the trailers, the posters, the promotional material, like every single aspect of this movie, there were five people independent of each other that could override everything. Jeez. So um, you ended up with this just nothing of a story. I have the original script that they wrote. Uh, the same writer wrote mm. the original script in 2014. Uh, it's not the first pass of the script, but it's the first pass with this group of people at the script. And it's really good. Um, it's not great, but it's really good. Better than what we got. Oh, least. anything would be better than what we got. What we got was horrible. Matthew McConaughey sleepwalks through the entire thing. Uh, I mean, he just was cashing a paycheck, obviously. The kid is terrible. The only thing that's good is actually the thing that people were the most upset about going in. Like, oh, Roland's played by a black guy. Like, he shouldn't be a black guy. Like, I never cared about that. Yeah. I couldn't have cared cared less. Like, he felt right for Roland to me. Like, he was this kind of strong, silent type, which yeah. very, very few actors can pull off not talking in a scene and, and still dominate the scene. Um, and and he's, he, he's one of them. And you're talking about, of course, uh, Idris Elba. Yeah, Idris Elba. Correct. Yep. And uh, he was the only salvageable part of that entire movie. But I'm hoping, like, they're saying that there still is going to be a TV series adaptation of it uh, that's going to be the fourth book in the series called Wizard and Glass. That's the best book in the series. It's a really a prequel more than anything else. Mm -hmm. um, it takes place years and years before the first book starts. And it really, like, informs a lot of the first, you know, several books and especially informs the later books. But that's the best of the series. It's one of the best things that Stephen King ever wrote. It's basically a love story. Um set in this really kind of fantastical world. But, you know, hopefully that, that will still move forward and hopefully it'll be much, much faster through production <laughs> and we won't have so many people, you know, trying to get their voices in. No. Uh, so uh, it's terrible though. No, uh, really quickly. Uh, is this based off of one specific book or is it based, is it like basically taking that whole Dark <laughs> yeah. Tower franchise and taking bits of it? Yeah, they it took, a uh, they tried to take about, I think the source material, the seven books, we're not going to include uh, Wind Through the Keyhole because that's not, that's kind of a side book that's not really part of anything. Uh, they took the seven books of the series. It's roughly 6,000 pages of material, six to seven, somewhere in there. Um, and they tried to turn it into a 93 minute movie. And with no plans of there being any additional. Yeah, movies, it basically, right? yeah, it basically was the kind of thing where. They wanted it to stand alone, but they wanted it to be able to be turned into a movie too, like into into a franchise. Right. So they tried to tell a whole story, but they also tried to leave it open ended. Uh, that doesn't sound like that would work. No, at it all. Do, it didn't work at all. Um, <laughs> the whole thing is a disaster. It doesn't take. It's not. It doesn't try and tell the whole story because it's really set up as it's supposed to be more of a sequel than a um, 
adaptation of the books. And that's mm. really, really hard to explain to anybody that hasn't read the books. And that's <laughs> even harder so to explain without spoiling stuff. Right. So I won't go any further than that. Okay. But, uh, yeah, they tried to pull... They didn't try and do everything from all the books, but they tried to pull pieces from pretty much every book. And it just... It's a disaster. It's a complete disaster. The whole wow. thing is a mess. Yeah, it sounds like it. And, I mean, honestly, you know, I've never read it, never seen any stuff on it um yeah don't waste I, your I time saw like with you know the movie. i Read saw like the, the one trailer that i saw a million times and first couple times i saw the trailer i thought it you know it looked kind of interesting um but then i kind of got bored seeing the trailer you know a million times kind of beaten into my head so yeah i don't really have any intention to see the movie but the the story behind it from what yeah, i heard from they, me sounds interesting so. yeah the story is great i mean it's it's you know the story of you have the gunslinger who's rolling and he's uh, trying to find this dark tower that's the kind of linchpin of the universe. It's uh, right. kind of a physical representation of the the being that holds the universe together in the book. It's called Gan. But, um, you know, and he's trying to find this because the world has moved on. You know, things are falling apart. Um, you know, nothing is right. And he thinks, or at least when you enter the series, you think he thinks that if he gets to the dark tower... Uh, he can kind of reverse course on this and and try and hold everything back together again, you know, and and gotcha. you know, not necessarily save the universe, but mm-hmm. um, you know, if nothing else, at least slow it down and and kind of return to a time where things were a little bit more stable. So you have this kind of world that's it's a really a mashup. Like Stephen King really wanted to write a western. Mm-hmm. Uh, is how it's how this started, and. As he started writing a western, he just realized like, like I just can't write just a straight western. Like it's just <laughs> not in me to write this. So he turned it into like this weird western sci-fi mashup thing. But we'll move on. Sorry. Oh no, Take yeah, that's too long. that's okay. Um, my next one, or I guess my number one worst adaptation, um, it's going to kind of mirror what my number one best adaptation was. And I'm going to, it's weird for me to even include this on worst adaptation list, but because of how much I talked about how much I loved it, but I'm going to have to say Harry Potter just for the sake of it, because in terms of being an adaptation, the things that they did change, there are things that they did leave out or the things they did add in to me are some of the most frustrating things. And some of, some of the things that I'm just like, why did you change this? Why did you leave this out why like because there are some things in some of the movies that i felt were or in some of the books i felt were so important and i felt like they i don't know that they changed stuff for the sake of changing it and obviously for those of you who don't know uh it wasn't just one director throughout the entire eight movies it right, was yeah. multiple directors so that is can have you know some to do with that but uh yeah it was just it was really irritating to me uh the things that they did change or the things that they did do differently and the one thing that i can never forgive the thing that drives me the most nuts about the entire movie franchise um my biggest complaint is from the very last movie pretty much almost the final scene harry potter and the deathly hallows part two and it is the way they handled the elder wand i know that you knew where i was going i knew so just very briefly, let me give you context. So in the movie, at the end, once Voldemort is taken care of, you get Harry, Ron, and Hermione are kind of out on this little bridge. You know, they're kind of talking about how everything's over. Harry snaps this Elder Wand in half, throws it over the bridge. Bada bing, bada boom. And then it's like, it's like, ah, we're free it's of it. Wrapped up in a nice little bow, right? But the problem I have with that is that is so... opposite of what happened in the book. In the book, what happened was Harry took the Elder... And I'm not going to go into explaining a bunch of stuff for people who don't know, uh, because if you don't don't know... You don't want to have a 20-minute conversation about wand lore? Right. If you don't know, you're probably not necessarily (laughs) going to care. But just very briefly, I'm going to try to rapid-fire this. Uh, Early on in this story, Deathly Hallows, Harry's particular wand got broken. And only special things can actually mend a wand. Well, this elder wand, which is like the wand of all wands, is the one thing that can fix his broken wand. And so what he does at the end of this book is he takes his elder wand, he fixes his wand, and then he puts the elder wand back with its original owner, who is dead. 
and he, you know he buries it back with him. So it's 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 beautiful. It's touching. He got his wand back. He did everything he was supposed to do. Yeah. None of that happens in the movie. He snaps that wand. Yeah. Doesn't fix his wand. As, throws it over the. As crazy bridge. as it is, when you had like two two and a half plus hour movies, uh, they cut that as like a time issue, which is insane. Like because some of the things that they included could definitely have been cut a little bit shorter. To give you the uh, the two minutes that it would have taken to tell that story. Oh, exactly. I mean, all they would have had to have shown... Like, they didn't even have to show him necessarily bearing the wand back with its previous owner. Or they didn't even necessarily have to show him fixing his wand. Just at least a passing line. You know, be like, oh, you know what? I think I can use... Maybe I can use this to fix my wand. And then cut to something else. But they had to, just for the sake of cinematics and... For the sake of just showing yeah. that this era was over, show him break it. And uh, yeah, I could go on and <laughs> on about that. But um, my my point was the reason why I include the Harry Potter series on my worst adaptation list as well is because the things they did change and leave out bothered me so much like that, that um, I had to go ahead and include it on this. So it's funny that I have yeah. it on my best and worst. Yeah. But anyway, so we'll go with right. your number two. Yeah. So I'm going to do, I'm going to do. Two and three, you really kind of. I'm just gonna fire through them real quick. Okay. Um. So my number two was Maximum Overdrive, which most people probably haven't seen if they're not at least forty years old. Yeah, I don't think um, I've seen that. <laughs> it came out like in the late seventies, like mid to late seventies, I think. It's the only movie that Stephen King ever directed. The whole thing's a complete disaster. Um. It's hilarious though. Like it's one of those movies that's so bad that it's almost good. Mm-hmm. Um. He was, uh, he had some pretty notable, like, substance abuse problems in that time period. And, uh, there's actually a script that's out there. If anybody's interested in it, you can find it. It's called Maximum King. That's about the making of that movie. Oh. And there are some absolutely ludicrous moments in that script that are just amazing. That's really the only reason I brought up Maximum Overdrive is just because, like, if you love, like, a horror movie that's so goofy, it's stupid, then, like, that's a great one to watch. <laughs> uh, and then if you want to look up the Maximum King script, because it is incredible. It'll never be made, by wow. the way. Anybody that is interested in that, it will never, 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 never be made. Uh, and then my last one is uh, I Am Legend, which is... Uh, oh, book. by the way, Maximum Overdrive was based on a short story that Stephen King wrote called Trucks. Okay. Um, Mac- I Am Legend... Same name and same story. It's also a short story. It's by Richard Matheson. Seen the movie, never read the book. Yeah. The story. Uh, The story, my biggest problem here comes with the ending. And the movie's been out. The movie's been out for like 15 years, so I'm going to spoil it. Like, if you haven't seen it by now, it's your fault. I think it's like 10 years, but you're close. Yeah, whatever. (laughs) Close enough. It's it's old enough that there was like a Batman versus Superman reference in it from like the first time they were talking about doing that. Yeah. Um, anyway, at the end of I Am Legend, like, he gets captured by, you know, the vampires or whatever you want to call them. Uh, Matheson never really called them vampires. I don't remember what the term was. weird human things. Yeah, yeah. Um, but he gets captured by them and thrown in, like, this cell because they had, like, a whole city. Like, in the movie, they were, like, you know, your kind of classic, like, kind of almost, like, zombie-ish vampires. Right. Um... But he gets, like, they had a society in the book, and he gets thrown in, like, this cell, and he's, like, awaiting trial, and they're probably going to execute him, and he comes to this realization, like, you know, I've been terrified of them for all these years, you know, and he's been hunting and killing them, and, you know, I mean, he kills, like, over a hundred of them throughout the course of this short book, Um, and he realizes, like, as he sits in the cell, that, you know, they were the monsters to him, but... For them, he was like the urban legend, like the boogeyman that they told their kids about at night and stuff to get them to not, you know, go out and and get into trouble, you know, like, because, you know, it's the boogeyman is like, oh, don't do bad things or don't stay out at night, you know, trying to get your kids scared to do what you wanted them to do. And like that, he was their version of that. So that was where the title I Am Legend comes from, is that he was the urban legend for them. And like he comes to this realization and the book just kind of ends with him like laughing hysterically in the cells. He's about to probably be (laughs) executed by these people because he realized like, oh man. I'm the monster. Yeah. Wow, that's pretty interesting. I can't even remember how the movie itself ended. 
It wasn't it like something like, oh, they found a cure. Yeah. Type thing? Like, I think he, there's two endings. I don't remember what the real, because like the people, like the regular ending the people is. turned into that because of some cure for cancer or something, right? Yeah. So he started to cure this woman and then they like come in and they break into his house. Like they, they overwhelm his house and they come downstairs and like this main guy that he's been dealing with the whole time takes this woman that he was experimenting back. And then there's another ending where he like has a grenade and he blows up like the whole lab and kills everybody. I don't remember which one's the theatrical ending. There's like, cause the alternate ending became pretty popular cause it's somewhat closer to the book because he does kind of have that realization that still sounds like that was like kind of a tenderness to them. Yeah. And he like kind of comes to this understanding like, Oh, maybe, maybe I've not been the one in the right here completely. Mm-hmm. So it's a little bit closer. It's still not the book ending, but right. Sounds like the know. book's still definitely a lot better. Yeah. Um, well, I'm going to rapid fire, obviously my two and three as well. Uh, for my number two, I'm going to talk about, uh, the maze runner scorch trials, which is, um, the Maze Runner series is a book series by James Dashner, and The Scorch Trials was the second book in that series, and it was the second movie. Um, it, we've only had two movies so far. The third movie is done, but it's kind of went through some production delays uh, because of some onset like accidents and stuff that's happened. But uh, either way, the I really loved the second book. It was, again, kind of like The Hunger Games. It, I think it was my favorite of that trilogy, um, but... Uh, I kind of thought the movie was garbage. I really liked the first Maze Runner movie. Uh, obviously, it changes some things like book movie adaptations do. Um, but for the most part, I really enjoyed it. Uh, you know, I thought that it, it did a pretty good job considering the things that it did change. But this second one, Scorch Trials, I just thought was a hot mess. Uh, the things that it did change made absolutely no sense to me. Uh, you know, people get captured that didn't get captured in the book. People don't get captured that did get captured, you know, uh, just it, it was horrible and things that it was complete opposite of catching fire, you know, things that I, again, while reading it, there were things that I was really excited about seeing portrayed on screen. I was really excited to see how some of these things were going to unfold and almost all the things I was excited about seeing, uh, they didn't happen on screen, didn't get to see them or they just did them in such a weird way that it was like, whatever. I don't even know coming out of that movie. I was like, I don't even know what I just watched. Cause that was definitely yeah. not the book that I had just read. Um, and then my third one I'm going to talk about, which I know you've got experience with too, is uh, Ender's game. And oh, it's um, one of my favorite books. Yes. And now I haven't read any other books in that series. I've got them. I read I, them all. I've got them on my Kindle, like ready to go, but I have not read them yet, but I read the first, the first book Ender's game. I read it before the movie came out. And so I was really excited um, cause it's, it's one of my cousin's uh, I, favorite books. I would stop after Xenocide. Like if you read through, like, that's just my advice. Like the other ones are okay, but mm-hmm. Xenocide is kind of where it ends. But yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so I was re- really excited to see this movie went in as soon as the movie was over. My jaw was just kind of dropped. Like, I cannot believe they screwed this up. <laughs> yeah. You know, I mean, I knew they were going to yeah. have to make some changes, especially with it's like a, the ages. It's another one of those. It's, it's a tough ad- adaptation. Beca- and I think a lot really of it difficult. is because of the aging. So, yeah. But and so much of it takes place in Ender's head. Yeah. It's so hard to put those things on the screen, especially when you're relying on somebody that's under 15 years old. To exactly. Well, really kind of someone portray. under 10. Yeah. Yeah. He should have been, I think he was well, six I mean, was how, the, yeah, that's, the that's how it should have been. Being yeah. Six, but yeah, obviously, you know, I mean, they, they had, had to dial that up. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, it, I guess if you go in just watching the movie as it is, maybe it's not as bad. I usually recommend to people, if you're going to watch the movie, if you haven't read the book, watch the movie first before reading the book. Otherwise, you're probably not going to enjoy the movie at all. <laughs> I would just not even watch but, the movie. Like, um, that would be my advice is yeah. just read the book and don't watch the movie yeah. because the book is one of the pillar sci-fi books ever written i mean now, it's, it's great some of the things were, were still cool to see like i still liked seeing like the battle school i liked seeing some of that on screen yeah like, some and of it, it still some looked, it looked cool. good yeah uh and i you know it, it which almost makes but, it more sad because yeah, it wasn't visually bad it was right. the story is what they screwed up which kind of stinks because we didn't get to see yeah because it's like this could have been a lot better uh, yeah. but it just it fell flat so uh coming out of that uh we're going to kind of have to rapid fire these questions so we can get to your little special yeah. thing. Yeah. Um, Tynan, I got a question for you. Should books be adapted to movies? Yes. Uh, constantly as much as we can. There's too high of a demand for movies to depend on only original screenplays. It's just, not, it's not a good thing. The, like many of the great movies of all time, like so many of the great movies are book adaptations. It's, it's crazy. It's always been a staple of Hollywood yeah. material. 
And my answer to that would also be yes. And I would take book movie adaptations any day over remakes or long overdue sequels. Yeah. Um, for sure. That's, that's my thought on that. And uh, another one, which we're really going to try to be brief on this because I know we'll have a lot to say about it. Uh, multi-part movies over one book. So splitting one book into yeah. two movies, good or bad? <sighs> Mostly bad. Um, it depends on the book sometimes. Could be good, but if they do it for the it, sake of following suit of like, I think Harry Potter was be, one of the first ones to do it. Yeah, they were. And everybody's the copied book. it. Um, um, especially like there's so many books now where it's like, oh, we're going to do a series and then we're going to split the last one into two. And that's just pretty much a straight money grab. Um, Harry Potter needed it. I thought that, yeah, I, I, I thought it was that. good because that last, yeah. that last one, they had a lot to put yeah, in. Yeah, there was a lot of material. Uh, Hunger Games did I, not need it. I don't know. Like, I, I think like a good, it's not like a hard, fast rule, but a pretty good rule of thumb is like 150 novel pages should be like 45 minutes to an hour on the screen, you know? So if you're making two and a half hour long movies, mm-hmm. You shouldn't be turning a book that's less than at least six or seven hundred pages into a two part movie. So, like for it, I don't have a problem with it. It's a fifteen hundred page book. It's right. a monster of a book. Uh, you know, breaking the now if they decide like, oh, we're gonna break the second movie into two parts and do three parts, I would right. be against that. Right. Like, two parts is good. Three parts is bad. Nothing should have three parts, pretty much. Um, one of my a good example of uh, this going wrong is The Hobbit. Oh, The I, Hobbit is I a love, freaking disaster. I love The Hobbit book. Yeah. And I still had a pretty good time watching the movies just because no, I, 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 I love that world, but it absolutely movies. was not necessary for them to be three movies. No. I could almost understand. I, I, I could get, could have gotten by with two, which is what the original Yeah, I think was, two would have been okay. But splitting it into three was They basically a made up mistake. everything in the second movie. Yeah. The second movie is definitely the worst of the three, in my opinion. Uh, I I love the first movie out of the three. Yeah, the first movie is pretty good. Uh, but yeah, so terrible. Multi part movies over one book. It it could be good depending on the circumstances, but Never most should be. most if of the it, time it's bad. If you need more than two movies to tell the story, it needs to be a TV show. Yeah, which was our third one. Do TV series work better for adaptations? Yeah, I books? think sometimes they do. Um, Especially the length of the series, like yeah. Game of Thrones. Yeah, if you try to do Game of Thrones in movies, it would be a disaster. Which I know their original talk years Complete and years and years disaster. ago were to bring oh, to a movie. Terrible. It would not have done well. No, it would have so been terrible. So TV series works perfect for something like that. Yeah, I think uh, it would make a great TV series. Like mm-hmm. maybe like 15 to 20 episodes, like two 10 episode seasons, something like that. Because uh, Stranger Things is actually, that was the idea behind Stranger Things. Is we're going to do a sci-fi version of it. Yeah, uh, based in the '80s, and that was the idea behind Stranger Things, and and it ended up being obviously amazing, huge hit. Yeah, um, it need like it would have been amazing. And I love the movie. It would have been amazing as a as a TV series, and there's a lot of things that would be great as a TV series. Okay, so we've had a lot to talk about. You know, we did a lot of stuff. It was uh, good. You know, we we were pretty long winded for some yeah, things. Yeah. Um, but this brings us to our special moment which I know is what you've been waiting for. I oh, yeah. carved it out specifically for you. You've been really passionate about it. You just saw it. So now we are going to let you have a few minutes to actually give us your review yes. over this movie of it. Yes, and yes, make sure yes. you end the review with your uh, rating. Like Give it like a letter grade of like okay. A through F. And you can do plus and minuses, whatever you like to do. Yeah. Uh, yep. But a couple minutes, go. All right, so uh, this is, uh, I heard somebody say the other day, and I agreed with it completely, it is not the best Stephen King adaptation, because Mm -hmm. I still think that honor goes to the Shawshanks and Green Miles of the world, but it is the most Stephen King adaptation. So if you've never read a Stephen King book, and you want to know, like, what kind of writer is Stephen King like, what does it feel like when you read a Stephen King book, like, what kind of tone does he set, go watch it, because that is the movie version of a Stephen King. I've never seen a movie that felt more like reading a Stephen King book. The kids are amazing. Uh, all those kids are great, 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 great. Uh, the girl that plays Beverly is going to be a freaking superstar. Uh, look out for her in the future because she is just ridiculously good in that movie. The kid that plays Richie also in Stranger Things. Oh, okay. Um, Finn Wolfhard. I think yeah. Finn Wolfhard. Name. Yeah. Uh, he is amazing. 
the kid that plays Ben is amazing. The kid that plays Bill is amazing. They're all the kids. Like, ridiculously good job that these kids did. It was so good. Uh, and that movie is rated R. Mm-hmm. It is intentionally rated R. And it is not a soft R at all. So, there's a scene. Uh, I don't think this is spoilery because it's the first scene. Everybody knows. This is the iconic it scene. With Georgie and the paper boat mm-hmm. and it in the sewer. So, in the original miniseries was Tim Curry. You see Georgie, he's talking to it, like, you know it's going to end badly. Uh, and then you see, like, this neighbor's, like, you know, messing around on her porch. And she sees Georgie, like, crouch in front of the sewer. And then it kind of fades to black. And then you're dealing with Georgie's death. Mm-hmm. So they did that in the movie. They go and they start to fade to black. And then they fade back in and you're back with Georgie and it. Oh, wow. And they went full throttle all the way through that scene. Like, giant teeth we're gonna rip this kid's arm off we're gonna do it on film like that was them laying their cards on the table they're like this is what we're gonna be buckle in like and that's like pretty much how the movie yeah uh, yeah that's the very first scene of the movie okay uh very first scene in the movie very first scene in the book very first scene in the miniseries uh that's always the opening scene of it right shouldn't be anything else should never be anything else um and then the movie just keeps going from there. Like it's it's violent, it's graphic, um, not like Lars von Trier kind of graphic, but it's it's graphic. Um, like I said, you're gonna you're gonna see a little kid get his arm ripped off in the first five minutes of the movie. So if that's not your thing, maybe don't go watch it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, no matter what you're afraid of, though. Yeah. That movie finds a way to make you afraid of that during the movie, which is perfect because that was what it was all about. Like, you know, whatever you're afraid of, we're going to find it. We're going to make you afraid of it right now. If you're afraid of blood, you're going to be afraid of it. If you're afraid of clowns, obviously, you're going to be afraid of it. If you're afraid of that whole, like, elongated jaw thing, you know, you're going to be afraid of it. If you're afraid of, like, disembowelment, you're going to be afraid of it. If you're, (laughs) yeah, if you don't like balloons, like, if you, I mean, there's so many things in this movie. Like, if if you're afraid of anything, it'll find a way to needle at that fear. Yeah. It's Um, all about individual fears. Yeah. Uh, It's, it is so good, you guys. Like, I can't even... It's my favorite Stephen King adaptation ever. Um, I don't know that it's necessarily the best because, again, Shawshank is pretty a pretty high mark to try and beat. Um, but, it, man, it's up there, especially if, if we're just talking about the horror movies. Mm-hmm. It's the best that they've ever done on a Stephen King movie for a horror movie. Um I mean, it is so good. I can't even <laughs> I can't even put into words how good it is. Um I've, I've seen it once. I'm going to see it again. I think tonight uh, I'm going to go see it in the IMAX. If you have the opportunity to just start in the IMAX, because I didn't, I didn't realize it was playing in the IMAX and right. I got tickets to a different theater. Um, go see it in the IMAX because some of these pieces are going to be so freaking cool in the IMAX. It's going to be great. Um, they spend so much time in the, in the movie though, just like in the book, building up these kids, building up their relationship between the kids. Um, you know, so much of it is built on the back and forth between them. You know, it's not a movie about a scary clown. It's not a movie about any, it's a movie about the kids. Like it's, it's right. really about the kids and you know, it's just the way that it should be. Um, they just did such a good job with it. The kids are amazing. It is amazing. Uh, they got dairy, right? Like dairy as a location and as a city, you know, it was always this kind of like, you know, almost demented, haunted kind of place, you know, like yeah. all, everybody was kind of infected by it. Um, and hmm. they, they got that right. Uh, they really got dairy, right? It's the first movie I've ever seen that gets a Stephen King location as a character. Correct. Um, so go see it. Uh, if I had to rate it, um, a through you F. know, it's a solid a, at least, um, you know, I could, I could give it an a plus to, if I'm, you know, being a little looser, but I mean, so definitely one of your top movies for this year. Oh God. Yeah. Last few years, yeah. maybe even. Oh God. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's, it might be my favorite movie of the year. Okay. Uh, I'd have to really like look at my list of everything for yeah. the year and see, you know, what else has come out. Get out is going to be really high on my list for this year, but uh, yeah, it's definitely in my top three easy. Uh, mm-hmm. And it might be the number one movie I have of the year. I'd give it an A on a, on a letter grade, like, a nine or a nine and a half on a, on a, uh, 
you know, a number grade. I mean, it's... So it gets the Tynan seal of approval. Oh, my God. Two thumbs way <laughs> up, man. Two hooked claw thumbs way, awesome. way up. It's so good. Now, don't expect a shot-for-shot shot remake of the book. Right. Uh, the first half of the movie, kind of the area where it's kind of driving the kids together, because they're not friends at the start of the book or the movie. They don't, most for the most part, they don't know each other. Um, and it kind of drives them together one by one. Those parts are pretty accurate to the book. Mm-hmm. And then after that, it's really less so. It's more interpretation than an adaptation. But they do such a good job with it. They get all the right things right. It feels right. It looks right. It, I mean, it's it's right. It's it's so good. <laughs> it, as bad as the Dark Tower is, it makes up for it and then some. And I cannot well, wait for the sequel. That's good um, that he had two... I, I yeah. mean, they didn't have two bad movies yeah. right in a row. And if you told me, so like, at the beginning opposite. of the year, I was really expecting it to be a complete disaster. I really was. Uh, I just didn't have high hopes for it. Kerry Fukunaga had left the project right. uh, last year or the year before, and I was really excited for his version. I have his script. It's really good. Uh, I don't know that it would have been better than this, though. Like, as much as that shocks me, like, as I came out of the theater, I was like, you know what? This script that I've been banging the table for and saying, like, this is the greatest script ever for two years now, <laughs> I don't know that it would have been better. I mean, it's so good. It, it's Go and see it. Like, I, even if you don't like horror movies, go and see it. Because it's not that scary. Like, it'll find a way to make you afraid of the things that you're afraid of. Right. But it's not like... You know, one of those just like terrifying movies. Like, it actually least, has a story to it. Yeah, uh, it's scary. Like, it's hard for me to judge that sometimes because I watch so many horror. Like, I love horror movies for anybody on here that doesn't know that. It's my right. favorite genre of movie. I watch so many. So it's kind of like, uh, it's kind of like haunted houses. Like, haunted houses don't scare me anymore. Like, Halloween houses, you know? Yeah. But I know a scary one when I see it. Right. Like, and that one, it was a scary one, but it wasn't one of those ones like, like, you're not going to be horrified for weeks after it. Like, you just need to go and see it because the kids are so amazing. Like, go and see it for the kids because the kids are great. Okay. They are great. Well, uh, that's pretty much all we got time for. We went over just a little bit, but that's okay. We we got a lot of stuff taken care of here, and I really appreciate you uh, being back on here, Tynan. Uh, um, it was a it. perfect topic for us to talk about, um, and we'll, you know, we'll come up with a, another one to have you back on that will be just as entertaining and maybe even better. So. Yeah. Uh, anyway, uh, as you guys know, this was an audio only, uh, portion. We have not stopped doing the video podcast. We just had some technical difficulties. So, uh, we took a break on this one for the video. Uh, but anyway, I thank you guys for listening again. Thank you, Tynan, for being here. Thanks for having me. And, um, be sure to check out our hack it out page on Facebook. Give us a like, uh, follow us on Twitter if you haven't already and subscribe to the YouTube channel. If you haven't already, that's, uh, hack it out or you can youtube.com slash hack it out seven. Thank you guys for listening and we will catch you later.